my thought in putting this together was that I did my thesis review about a year ago, and I had a couple of technical people in my review because I'm friends with them because I'm PhD students, and um, I think they enjoyed it, but I think it went over their heads a bit. So I um, thought I might give a go, give this a go, kind of making it a little bit more approachable, um, and see what you think. Um, so, I also have a speech because I'm a little bit terrified of um, ad living, so I hope you forgive me. I'm trying to make it interesting. Um, so, basically, I thought I would start um, by introducing to you to this short film, uh, which is called The Powers of Ten um, by Eames Office. So, it's a bit long to play right now because it's nine minutes long, so that'll take up most of my talk. Uh, but um, I'll give you a quick rundown of what it is. So Eames Office was the practice of Charles and Ray Eames, um, who were really incredibly famous uh, mid-century industrial designers. And they um, created this film with the idea that understanding scale has the power to make us better scholars and better citizens. So it begins with these two centre squares, these guys, um, two people having a picnic in Chicago. And for the first half of the film, um, the camera zooms out so that every 10 seconds we view the starting point from 10 times further out. So, that. Um, and then the second half of the film takes the starting point again and zooms inwards with 10 times more magnification every 10 seconds. So, that's actually going that way. Um, so, this creative output chooses one specific concept, scale, in order to synthesize a disparate array of scientific knowledges from the micro to the macro scales of the universe, and to make it accessible to a range of audiences. The result for viewers is a shared understanding of difficult to comprehend scale, scales and a renewed sense of the specificity of the human scale in relation to the many alternate factors of 10 that, although um, focused onto the exact same spot where the picnic is sit, obscure human perspective altogether. So, the agenda of Charles. Is it possible to, to have a microphone? Oh, and maybe yeah, it's no just problem. Over, uh, I'm oh, I'm trying to project as well, so it must be microphone time. Sorry about that. That's okay. So, should I put that onto. Oh, I did put it. Convenience. Spending too much time in the power plant. Is that okay? Can you hear me now? Is that better? Much better. Thank cool. You. Okay, sorry. Do I start again? <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so the, the agenda of Charles and Rainings in Making Powers of Ten is the same that underlies my own research as I gather information through time, different scales, and alternate understandings of space. My aim is to think carefully and productively about landscape change in order to understand how it happens, to imagine new possibilities for its future and to communicate these things in an engaging way for productive conversations. So we'll see if I do that last one. My starting point for developing my overarching research agenda was the issue of post-running landscape planning. So when I began my PhD, my original research interest was in novel and innovative landscape design for my enclosure. So for example, the Eden Project, uh, the Lusatia region in Germany, the potential for innovation, uh, and the potential for innovation more specifically in Australian post-running landscapes. But I realized that in Australia there's been fairly little innovation from a design perspective, um, and the industry as a whole produces from a community and a landscape architecture perspective often not very responsive final landforms in terms of aesthetics and usability. So I guess we can have an argument about that afterwards if you want. Um, these problems are also tied to the economic futures of rural areas entering into a post-mining state. And from my own fieldwork, I'm a I have observed that landscape design has the potential to exacerbate or soothe feelings of abandonment, hopelessness, and powerlessness. So I hypothesized that the issue of landscape design must have its origins in particular processes and belief systems that govern the planning processes, and decided to go down a path instead of understanding some of the underlying ideological viewpoints that guide post mining landscape outcomes. And that's ultimately led me to a totally different research um, area. So, I wanted to start off by problematizing three existing states or paradigms that are prevalent um, from my understanding 
Western Australian government, and which define the ways the landscapes are understood and therefore their capacity for reinvention. In doing so, I'm not trying to position these things as specifically bad, but to think through the ways in which their dominance has overtaken other kinds of thinking. I want to argue that existing approaches to landscape design and planning are often approached from a flat position similar to the one meter and the 10 meter images of the people in the picnic rug. I will then present three alternative paradigms that are at the forefront of research approaches in human geography and environmental humanities, and consider how the application of these new, um, of these offers new methods for interpreting landscape. I argue that these methods can help to zoom in, and out, zoom in or out of the people in the picnic rug to show some of the different configurations that are more difficult to view. So the first one is implicit positivism. Um, <coughs> positivism refers to a worldview that was established in the 1800s and which became the dominant scientific method in the 20th century. It takes the approach that knowledge emerges through direct observation and sensory experiences of reality. Within this, theories can be falsified or verified through logical, scientific, or mathematical testing. Positivism as a knowledge approach fell widely out of favor in the social sciences and philosophy during the 1960s, but has remained one of the dominant principles for science and likewise for industry dependent on applied sciences. The key interconnected characteristics of positivism that lead to its partial demise are, within social science and philosophy, are value-neutral objectivity and the view from nowhere. So value-neutral objectivity is the idea that scientists can synthesize knowledge based on unmediated sensation without influence from individual biases. Can you slow down just a uh, I can try. <laughs> um, okay, the view from nowhere, when framed as an aspirational outcome within positivist inquiry, is an apparent transcendence from individualism to universality, wherein the individual scientist applying positivist methodology is so objective that they are removed from social and cultural contexts, and they become a proxy or a spokesperson for all people. This manifests as the passive, objective tone of scientific and academic writing, where the writer removes themselves from the text and the writing assumes a sense of disembodied authority. Within our contemporary social context, this is problematic. With universality now understood to be synonymous with a Western, often white male perspective. As such, it's Covertly but inherently only a partial perspective, reflecting the standpoint only of one powerful social group. Although regulations are continually evolving to attempt to better manage mining within its physical context, they exist within the narrow margins of the, this positivist epistemology, um, way of knowing, uh, that strives towards universality through streamlined narratives that tell succinct and disciplinarily restrictive re accounts of the world. So these approaches reinforce objectivity and quantitative reporting in all areas, and also separate social and environmental considerations both from each other and from the pragmatism of the rest of the mining process. Like positivism, this nature-culture divide is deeply entrenched in regulatory belief systems. Culture and nature are both understood as specific domains of reality that are assumed to exist independently of each other. The separation of nature and culture is a persistent theme throughout Western history. Although there are always shifting ideas around the value of nature, so it's gone through this massive history where it's um, being reconceived as things like wastelands and Eden and this kind of like sublime landscape and pastoral, um, it's consistently labeled as outside and separate to both urban areas and humanity. So, that, so urban areas and humanity are where culture can apparently be found. This deliberate separation of culture and nature means that it's difficult for industry and government to recognize the ongoing interconnectedness of human with environment. Instead, regulations and guidelines seek to isolate and mitigate the impact of human intervention on the natural environment, while at the same time seeking to maintain quality of life for the local community without recognizing that they exist within the wider geographic environment of the site, within nature. So, Duffany and also um, in 2014 wrote about the social terrain which is the idea of an inherent connection between the geographic context of a particular mining area, in their case they were talking about Guatemala, and the direct influence of the local landscape's characteristics, um, that the local landscape's characteristics have on the development of community responses to CSR practices. So they argue that firms should embed their social practice programs in the unique physical landscapes of their sites, because the physical properties of places 
such um, the physical properties of place, such as mineralization, topography, and soil, shape social relations and acquire social meaning. So, um, in a report that was released by Ernst & Young and SMI in 2017, um, the researchers interviewed more than 60 senior mining ex executives, both anecdotal evidence and mapping of internal communication networks, pointed towards a problem with siloed communication. Um, so this is a quote from that study. Um, in one study at a large mine, maintenance and processing employees were asked to nominate people who they regularly involved in problem solving. When these connections were turned into network maps, it showed that very little communication existed between these functions. On some whole of mine technical problems such as water management, no direct connection between the functions was found. So topics and program, pro, uh, problems like water management exist outside of the dis disciplinary boundaries as complex embryos of science, politics, economy, law, religion, and technology fiction. Disciplinary boundaries are human constructs. But within our traditional knowledge approaches, we remain bound to them. So Bruno Latour, um, who's a continental theorist who specializes in scientific knowledges, offers a useful quote around this. Um, By all means, they seem to say, let us not mix up knowledge, interest, justice, and power. Let us not mix up heaven and earth, the global stage, and the local scene, the human and the non-human. But these embroglios do the mixing, you'll say. They weave our world together. Act as if they don't exist, the analyst replied. So this issue with disciplinary silos is not novel, obviously. Um, it's maybe a newer and more specific term. Um, and of course, there's work being done with SMI, um, and specifically through the Complex All Studies Program to transcend these boundaries. Um, still worth pointing out. So I'm guided in my research by the directive given by Anna Singh in her brilliant book, The Mushroom at the End of the World. And she says, to enlarge what is possible, we need other kinds of stories, including adventures of landscapes. So in order to meet this agenda, it's increasingly clear that crossing disciplinary and knowledge boundaries and acknowledging the process of knowledge creation are the keys to understanding landscape change more comprehensively. As such, the following alternative methods or knowledge frameworks help make visible different ways of seeing and understanding landscape and landscape change that go beyond regulatory frameworks and stability of landforms. Instead, they shift across different scales and histories to find new, new viewpoints, much like the powers of 10. They help make visible these incremental steps taken by an array of actors over a long period of time that slowly transform a site into something different. So, science and technology studies is a field of study that examines, sorry, water. The <coughs> social, cultural, and political influences on scientific and technological knowledge production and implementation. It views science and technology as socially embedded enterprises. This is effectively a progression from positivism to disembodied and totally objective scientist. Instead, acknowledging that individual theories, hypotheses, background knowledge, and values of the researcher can influence what is observed. It also suggests that social relationships in science influence the direction of scientific development but are rarely acknowledged. For example, a chance discussion in a hallway with a colleague sets you on a different path of inquiry that might be crucial to a discovery, but it will never make it into a journal article. The tools diagram um, is uh, kind of overly complicated, but it essentially shows that um, knowledge production can negotiate, um, so negotiation back and forth um, between social and technological domains as it develops. This particularly important mindset uh, for, a develop for dealing with established regulatory systems and methods of working because it reminds us that they don't emerge spontaneously or objectively. They're crafted by people with specific mindsets and are liable to be fallible and subjective, just like people. So new, ma new materialism gives matter and non-humans like bacteria agentic capabilities and refu refuses to downplay the non-human as something static and only brought into being by its encounter with human consciousness. Effectively, new materialism gives space to different time and geographic scales and acknowledges the influence of matter beyond humans on systems and processes. So Jane Bennett has a useful quote, um, that's beautiful, and I find it helps to think of, kind of uh, geology, geomorphology when I re read it. Um, so the stones, tables, technologies, words, and edibles that confront us as fixed are mobile 
Materials whose rate of speed and pace of change are slow compared to the duration and velocity of the human bodies participating in and perceiving them. Objects appear as such because they're becoming, proceeds at a speed or a level below the threshold of human discernment. So this is a useful idea for the landscapes of extraction, which are dependent on mineral distribution that happens through earth processes that cross huge, huge time scales. There's a whole front half to any story of mining that's about techno tectonic movements, water flows, sedimentary buildup that sets up the human-centric narrative of extraction. It also compacts human activity into a very small period of time in comparison to geologic time frames, giving us perspective. It's a useful tool, I find, for deflating egos. This concept effectively overrides the idea of separation between nature and culture because it allows different perspectives that highlight their interdependency. Uh, this one is probably the weirder one, <laughs> the fuller thing. Um, building on the ideas of both science and technology studies and new materialism, Donna Haraway suggests the concept of the Thulu scene. The Thulu scene is an idea of collecti collective production and of blurred boundaries between individuals and across systems. Haraway uses this painting um, on the slide of endosymbiosis as a metaphor or illustration of the Thulu scene. Thinking of our world as one in which critters interpenetrate one another, loop around and through one another, eat each other, get indigesting, and partially digest and partially assimilate one another, establishing arrangements that are otherwise known as cells, organisms, and ecological assemblages. What Haraway proposes is a shift in perspective to a world where nothing is self-organizing or self-contained, and stories of landscapes should be messy, nuanced, and full of blurred boundaries. Okay. okay, so I'll turn to an example of uncovering stories of landscape change. Um, this was um, my case study from my so Lee Creek is a coal mine six hours drive north of Adelaide in South Australia. It was key to the internal electricity supply of South Australia throughout the second half of the 20th century and was a symbol of both independence of the state and South Australia's manufacturing industry. It's been operating as an open cut coal mine since 1944 and its coal is such poor quality that it can only be used in a specifically designed Port Augusta power station. The mine is located remotely in the outback near the Flinders Ranges. It has a town, also called Lee Creek, um, and a remote population of about 500 people, plus the town residents, that are all heavily reliant on the services centralized within the town, including the supermarket, police, health clinic, and school. Within the context of the life of the mine, Lee Creek has been going through um, closure planning since 2015 and ceases, ceased operations in March 2016, just as I was going on my first scoping visit. It's since been in a liminal zone of planning and slowly losing populations, uh, population numbers in the Lee Creek Township as people leave in search of work or retirement. My most recent visit was in the first half of 2018, when the town was nearly deserted, just before the closure plan was publicly released. I interviewed people about what they hoped would happen to the landscape, the realities they envisioned, and how they remembered it changing. I asked them what was important to them about the landscape of the mine site and the region. This was a difficult thing to discuss because for a great many de um, decades, the landscape within the mine site had been conceptually separated from the regional landscape. People had become accustomed to, unaccustomed to thinking about their relationship with it. So um, this map, um, I'll just tell you about it. Um, this conceptual separation is fairly beautifully demonstrated in this 1980s geographical survey, where the blank area at the top, just here, um, is where the mining topography should be. The specific and exclusive area of the mining lease falls under the purview of the mining company, and correspondingly the government largely erases the area of the mining lease, and particularly the operating mine site, from its geographical imaginary as it manages the greater region. As I have spoken with residents and spent time in the area, there's been an opportunity to question whether this separation is the, rea the reality on the ground, <coughs> and to consider the winding ways in which these land scopes, land forms and land uses actually come about. <coughs> so I'll concentrate on one specific um, example of a water geography that doubles as mining infrastructure as a way of telling a story that captures the complexity of land use change and the interesting fluidity between social, environmental, and scientific decision-making. The point of telling a story like this is to think through the connections between the material landscape and its social life. 
the way in which multiple viewpoints in relation to the site can shape new uses from old problems. It's also very interesting to keep in mind the idea that not all changes are human-led. So, the yellow-footed rock quality has evolved with a predilection for the cliffs, ridges, and rocky outcrops in the South Australian semi-arid lands around, our, uh, around the creek. They're very small, shy, and well camouflaged creatures, and they have a long golden striped tail. It's just very beautiful. Although the abundance of yellow-footed rock wallabies before European colonization is kind of difficult to ascertain, there are lots of records from early white settlers who kept diaries. In the case of Edward John Eyre, his search for water and food seemed frequently to involve eating wallabies. Eyre described both the yellow-footed rock wallaby and the place where he first saw it, Mount Aruna, in great detail. Mount Aruna would later become central to the conservation story. Through the diaries of settlers, it seems that the rock wallaby was in virtual plague proportions before the 1890s. As a consequence, they were shot for meat and for sport, with bounties for scalps and high prices for the quality pelts. In addition to human interference, they were also targeted by introduced predators, including foxes and feral cats, and forced to compete with other animals, including goats, sheep, and rabbits for habitat. The numbers were quickly decimated. From 1912, they became a protected species and were listed as um, vulnerable by the end of the 20th century. In 2001, their close relative in Queens, uh, sorry, in 2001, the species estimate was between 5,000 and 10,000 individuals, inclusive of their close rel relative in Queensland, with the largest populations in the Flinders ranges. Um, the topography that made a mountain arena a perfect habitat for wallabies also made it an ideal site for water collection and storage, a supply solely needed by the human population and mining operations of a nearby Lake Creek. In the 1940s, the water requirements skyrocketed with the new coal mine and its attached town and railway. So that's the 1940s town and 50s. Um, in the 1940s, um, sorry, with the sizable Inuman and the creeks, both flowing into Aruna Creek, and the high quartzite ridges on either side of Aruna Gorge forming natural walls, the Mount Aruna site seemed perfect. Um, with construction completed by the mining company in 1955, this new Aruna dam was able to store 7,500 megalitres and supply water to the region for a period of six months without recharge. This site intervention altered the, the immediate area, providing a huge and genuinely surprising body of water in the middle of the semi-arid semi environment. Aruna Dam became a new type of landscape, thoroughly artificial. Its primary identity was now its infrastructure to provide water for the mine, the town, the railway, and the region. Its previous settler use as grazing land was halted. An un unanticipated outcome, however, was that its open, permanent water source attracted a large number of animals, both herbivores and predators. The water security it afforded led to significant increases in their numbers. The lack of regulation around and access to um, around access and occupation of the site allowed a secondary unofficial use as for animal habitat to emerge. It's likely that the increased challenge to food and safety is what led to the extinction of the rock wallaby colony in the Aruna area in the early 1980s. These drastic changes to the land use and management led to overgrazing and a loss of plant species as well as significant wolf damage to plants. This in turn let the topsoil break loose as um, dust particles that were easily carried by wind and water into waterways, particularly during flood events. This started to become a serious problem for the mining company as, as silt quickly accumulated in the dam, suspended in the water and creating a sludgy mess. By 1982, silt had reduced the available water for drinking and mine use by 2,500 megalitres, a third of the dam's original capacity. The silt and the feral animals had become actors in their own right able to form a chain of events that totally undermined the man-made site and prove themselves just as effective at altering the land use. This is an interesting example of the Thuluci, blurring the boundaries between individual feral animals, plants, root systems, and grains of soil as they work together to collectively produce an outcome, consciously or otherwise. Mining and government reports from the time recommended three main strategies for reducing further soil erosion, elimination of grazing, warren ripping, and reseeding with perennial species. With these needs established, rabbits became the most significant problem as they consumed any vegetation within the receding areas before it was able to become established, disrupting the rehabilitation plan. In addition to rabbits, 
goats were earmarked as having a direct and significant impact on the immediate Aruna, Aruna area's loss of vegetation quality as a result of overpopulation, overconsumption, and roof damage. So, in response to the animal issue, an eradication initiative was instigated by the then mine operators, the Electricity Trust of South Australia, ETSA, and was later taken over by subsequent mining companies following privatisation. This program was concerned not with the ethics and environmental sustainability, but with the direct and practical economic impacts of fixing the immediate environment. So that's kind of demonstrated by this group here. Um, on the ground, this ETSA-initiated approach <coughs> was twofold and targeted the rabbits and goats, goat problem separately. Rabbits were tackled with baiting and ripping, but the goats required a more temporally intensive elimination regime. And the ETSA employees found inspiration in the approach taken by a nearby conservation park, inviting the, the elite special tasks and rescue police to visit for an intensive two-day shooting practice, culling 4,000 goats. The feral animals were now at a population level significantly below the surrounding properties. There was a chance to redirect the land use back to human-specific purposes. But the feral control agenda was not universally shared by the human residents of the Lee Creek Township, with personal attacks carried out by interview participants during the entire, uh, despite the entire town population working for and within the same mining company. So he says, we had bullets in the mailbox, we had rocks on the roof because of the rabbits, and they called me a bloody murderer. I remember once the car, I wanted to go to Adelaide. I'd just look at the wheels and the nuts were undone and thorn. So that was fairly, uh, fairly serious. It was not the most popular thing. The irony, of course, being that the culling program was conducted specifically in order to provide water to the town, as well as the mine. In understanding the strength of this reaction, including genuine attempts at murder, it's also important to consider the benign sanitized words used in the control of feral animals in overpopulation, and compare this to the reality of the situation. So Paolo Bocci um, discusses the traumatic experience of an experiment in feral goat control in the Galapagos Islands where international funding, helicopters and dogs were brought into the island and hunters recruited and hunters were recruited to carry out a large scale sustained assault against the goats, resulting in rotting mangled carcasses strewn across the landscape and the trauma of the deaths lingering in the minds of the inhabitants. The mission goal in Bosch's case was to rid the island of goats so they would stop impacting the lives of native tortoises. And so the culling was similarly carried out in the name of caring for the environment. Well, slightly different. This knowledge, however, didn't lessen the impact of the huge scale of, get, um, of death on the human population of the islands. Thinking of this example, I asked my interview, interviewee what happened to the goat carcasses. He was surprised by my question, but replied that of course they were left where they died. There was no way to pick up 4,000 goat bodies bloated in the sun. So a second irony, at the time of this at the same time as this feral goat control program, there was a significant influx of the human population at Lee, as Lee Creek Township was rebuilt in a new location and for a much increased population, and the mine site expanded its operations. This need for additional water supplies led to the building of a desalination plant and bore fields, suddenly rendering a ruined dam unnecessary as mining infrastructure. What to do with this freshly rehabilitated site that had no use? So, during the 1994 Rock Wallaby Symposium, um, the Adelaide Zoo received unanimous support for a trial release of the other footed rock wallabies. Reintroduction science was in its infancy, and this was an experiment to see if reintroduction could be used for more critically endangered types of wallabies. The Aruna Dam was officially chosen as a release point because of the environmental commitment of the staff, because it was a known habitat for rock wallabies but had no existing population, and because of the feral eradication program. In reality, there were some interesting social connections that influenced the decision. The CEO of the Adelaide Zoo, from his previous role at the Botanic Gardens, was already friends with the main environmental officer and had set up an ongoing exchange program with his staff members in Lee Creek. It was a tight social network, as demonstrated by this quote. Is it better if I read the quote? Okay. Aware of the reintroduction program, Aware of the reintroduction project, the environmental officer asked the mining company to ask the minister to designate the area as a private wildlife sanctuary. It became a ruined sanctuary, and its new mission was to provide shelter and protection for native species. This is a clear instance of the negotiation between scientific processes and social interactions, 
as Latour outlined, with the social side never mentioned in the reports, of course, allowing a neat convergence of access and protection that laid the groundwork for a scientific justification of the site. In this context, it's particularly interesting to note that the dam itself, the reason the site existed, was fundamentally a negative characteristic for wallaby reintroduction, as it drew in the, fa the feral animal population and larger macropods to compete with the rock wallabies for food and shelter. Regardless, the decision to relocate, uh, to locate the reintroduction trial within Aruna prompted a new set of interactions in yet another land use, this time moving beyond land rehabilitation for infrastructure towards active species protection. So, release of the rock wallabies was conditioned upon having no fox sightings within the sanctuary for a period of six months. To achieve this, far more extensive feral animal control needed to be undertaken both within the sanctuary itself and in the wider region. The difficulty that was faced by the new interorganizational team working on the reintroduction project was how to persuade pastoralists, as the most significant landholders surrounding the sanctuary, to implement fox baiting within their properties, particularly when it can impact their farming dogs. The reports barely mentioned the task of pers persuading farmers to participate in creating a buffer zone, but it was an impressive social feat. Within this tricky engagement process, the area school became a useful tool for the zoo employees working on the project. Children from the entire region attend the Lee Creek School, including the children of pastoralists. Much like McDonald's advertising, the logic was that the involvement of the children in the project had the potential to influence the larger region, overcoming the problem of pastoralist participation. Engaging school staff members, the team were able to integrate the project within the curriculum. The most significant contribution was from Year 9 English, which produced a series of newsletters, the Rock Wallaby News, that were mailed free to the, communi the local community with the objective of keeping knowledge around the reintroduction up to date. The success of this school engagement project um, process had a direct impact on the scale of the buffer zone, which expanded significantly beyond its expected extent. Um, so that's the uh, official accounts of the buffer zone. Um, and then this is kind of the on the ground reporting about what actually the buffer zone ended up being. Um, yes, okay. The target of no fox signings was reached and the wallabies were released. The success of the rock wallaby conservation project's overall engagement process and tangible environmental impact required a reframing of the Aruna Dam mining infrastructure to the Aruna Sanctuary, shifting the landscape from infrastructural to environmental. It also required the children and later the pastoralists to change their own understandings of their properties and view them instead as part of the larger landscape that could collectively provide native habitat. They also began to view their land as a barrier to feral animals, with a view towards the protection of another external piece of land, effectively an inverse mine frame of the 1980s survey map that extracted the mine site from its regional context. This ecosystem transformation was therefore premised upon a socially constructed idea of what the landscape should or could be. The process of returning it to a natural pre-settler state um, was in fact the construction of an artificial landscape based around the cultural construct of nativeness, a human-imposed value system that elevated the rock wallaby over the goat and the rabbit. What was created was a collective dream, recreating a spectre of a landscape gone, long gone by maintaining a permeable boundary of poison, a ghostly apparition for a few fleeting years before the trial was eventually called successful and reintroduction sites became normalized, before the zookeepers left for other projects before the mine closure meant that Aruna Sanctuary mysteriously disappeared from the state's list of sanctuaries. To further emphasize the flexibility of the human capacity to physically remake landscapes, according to their individual viewpoints, I'll turn briefly to the then newly built Lee Creek Township, which sets up a neat contrast to Aruna Sanctuary. Lee Creek Township, the geographic center of rock wallaby community engagement, is situated within the same parcel of land as Aruna Sanctuary and was owned by the mining company. An oasis in the desert, the planning, oh, technically its slogan is Oasis in the Desert. Um, the planning of the new town in the 1970s recognized the preference of local, the very vocal residents within the old Lee Creek Township for trees and shrubs to pr provide shelter, shade, and most importantly, visual relief. A significant factor consistently acknowledged in planning reports and documentation is the psychological value of green trees in an arid region. The resulting town plan included around 250,000 shrubs and trees, 
and there were several there were several large lawns maintained, including the school oval and the memorial park in the outback. These trees needed drip irrigation systems to survive in the semi-arid environment, and complex fertilizers and topsoils were added to overcome the soil deficiencies. This problematic relationship between the situated semi-arid climatic reality of the town site and the green landscape expectations of the townspeople is never critiqued during the planning and construction process. Seeking to return Aruna Sanctuary to a pre-European state of existence, while Lee Creek Township simultaneously existed as a prime example of a deliberately altered landscape akin to terraforming on the same parcel of land, it becomes an instance, an intense instance of double think. It highlights the way in which humans elevate and separate themselves from nature, the way we detach urban or industrial sites from their wider geographic contexts. At its opening, the town was applauded for its environmental planning considerations, and over 30 years later, its occupants continue to echo the same concepts of sustainability. So, thinking back to the shifting scale of the powers of 10 and the change in perspective caused by zooming further into or out of one image, it's clear that landscapes can similarly become a different, a completely different picture as you change perspectives. Zooming into one specific site and finding the right instruments for viewing it, for example, using new methods and theories that prompt different thinking about the world, can reveal a complexity that vanishes at the level of reporting and planning. In South Australia, all these ad hoc histories have blurred boundaries of control and ownership and feed into and out of one another to create a landscape trajectory that will continue to influence and define the site after mine closure. Within the governmental and industry master narrative of the site, however, the story is a natural seamless transition from dam infrastructure to sanctuary, with an unproblematic handback to the government for a tourism future, not thinking about how the silt might continue to build up. Um, so many people from the great area still think that their water supply comes from the river dam. So what does this specific history mean in the broader picture of industrial landscape planning? It demonstrates that landscape change is not just a rational engineering exercise. Animals and soils aren't governed by risk management principles. Scientists and engineers are social beings who make decisions through their social networks. What these histories show is that landscape change isn't dra drafted up in a vacuum, but is piecemeal, nuanced, dirty, messy, has a real depth and tangled stories. And it's sexy now to think about alternative land uses. But first we need to begin taking landscape seriously and to attempt to understand the relationship between social and material. Good landscape planning embraces this reality. It plans for it and hopes for it. By remembering these layers of history, we can let their spirit of disruption guide us as we begin to, begin to plan for more interesting, exciting, adventurous land uses and landscape futures. Thank you.